when I was in high school, I imagined for a number of years that I was going to be an actor or a director or a playwright. I was in a bunch of plays and I directed my classmates in a bunch of plays and I actually wrote several plays. I haven't seen those scripts in years and years. I would be nervous and excited to revisit them now. I'm not sure what I would find in their pages. As we were preparing for uh, performances, especially when we were early on in rehearsals, we would sometimes do an exercise whereby we would take a line and see how many different ways we could deliver it. The very same words, but could be delivered with, with all sorts of different emotion or, or with different physical actions or with different kind of intention behind them. And in so doing, we would sometimes discover things about the character or about the play or about ourselves. So we could take a really short line, uh, a, a script that actually has but one word in it. We could choose, um, or a line, excuse me, that has uh, but one word. And then we could choose the, the line, hello. How many different ways could we say the word hello? Well, we could say hello. So this is perhaps how you might be greeted at uh, when you go into Pete's. Hello, welcome to Pete's, right? There's a sort of a chipperness, a, uh, an expectation that you are welcome in this place. We want to engage with you. It may or may not be put on a little bit, especially if it's in a, in a commercial context. It's kind of expected that the barista is going to be friendly. What's another way we could say this one line? <sighs> Hello. Right? So now I'm kind of reluctant to see you. There's an element possibly of hostility in uh, this greeting. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm less enthused. They're kind of, for whatever reason, I'm not excited about our encounter. How about, how about one more, just for fun? Hello. Now, what about that one? Right? Suddenly there's a playfulness bordering on bad boundaries, right? Right? This is, this is someone who's, who's you, you, you may, you may want to exercise some caution with someone who says hello to you in that fashion. And we could keep going, right? There's probably 20 or 25 more ways that we could say this one word. And, and in all cases, the root meaning is the same. I see you and I greet you, but there's all sorts of new uh, permutations around it. This exercise was always fun. Uh, always illustrative about the play and about our characters. And it was particularly challenging with old school plays. Uh, contemporary plays, often the, um, the playwright will put in stage directions, so there's square brackets and italics, that will tell you how they imagine the character saying a word or, or a phrase. They're going to they're gonna speak a line, you know, angrily or quietly or through tears. But when you get into older plays, and Shakespeare in particular, well, Shakespeare is famous for the absence of stage directions, and certainly the absence of instructions on how to say lines. And as a consequence, there are centuries of interpretation, centuries of uh, thousands and thousands of different ways of saying to be or not to be. That's the question, right? And they're all right in their own way. So I love the, the lectionary, the schedule of readings that we follow from one Sunday to another. I love that over a three-year cycle, it takes us through the Bible in almost its entirety. And I love the discipline that it imposes upon us. I think as a preacher absent the lectionary, I would just preach in my favorite passages over and over again. And certain parts of scripture which are confusing or hard or just strange, I would probably ignore. And the lectionary makes us uh, confront those and it makes us explore uh, the breadth of the Bible. That's a gift. And there are days on which the lectionary drives me nuts. Uh, it, it makes some choices that uh, I find inexplicable or annoying on occasion. So I, uh, it bugs me that over three years, we never once read the first uh, half of the book of Jonah. 
uh, on a Sunday. Uh, Jonah is uh, theologically so rich, and it's probably also the funniest book in Scripture. And I wish we had some time with that on Sunday morning. It bugs me that uh, we read way less of the Psalms of Lament than we might on Sunday mornings. We do a psalm every, pray a psalm together every morning. Uh, but generally speaking, on Sundays, you would not guess how many of the psalms complain to God, express anger, express despair, express uh, depression and deep grief. Uh, that's a huge part of our tradition that you maybe wouldn't clue in if you were relying on the lectionary to tell you uh, what uh, the Bible looks like. And then there's today. So today we, uh, we have this reading from John, from the fourth gospel, and it is this uh, famous, famous encounter between Jesus and Pilate. This is this encounter that begins with Pilate interviewing Jesus and ends with Jesus interviewing Pilate. It's an absolutely extraordinary encounter, and we heard it, we heard the, this reading today from John, uh, and the lectionary directed Liz to stop reading with uh, Jesus saying, um, whoever walks in the truth listens to my voice. That is, that's where we cut it off. However, in John, Jesus says, uh, whoever walks in the truth listens to my voice, and then Pilate says something else. Does anybody know? Exactly. Pilate says, what is truth? This absolutely extraordinary question. Uh, and, 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 that, uh, and that is gone from uh, the lectionary as it, as it establishes it for us this morning. I've been, thinking about, um, I've been thinking about Pilate's question today, what is truth? and thinking about it through the lens of my old acting exercise. How does Pilate say these words to Jesus? How does he say, what is truth? It's a challenging one, right? Because uh, scripture in common with Shakespeare 15 or 1600 years later, generally speaking, doesn't have stage directions, generally speaking, doesn't like a modern novel. Uh, tell us how someone is talking. Generally speaking, scripture doesn't say he said angrily, or he said sadly, or, uh, he, or I have no idea what. He, um, you know, he, he said through gritted teeth. That's typically not in scripture. And a second thing makes it really challenging to guess how Pilate says these words, and that is that John does something absolutely unreal uh, in, in this encounter, which is that Pilate asks this question, what is truth? And John immediately cuts to a new scene. Uh, so uh, in, in, in the gospel, uh, Pilate says, what is truth? And then it goes on, the very same verse goes on. Uh, and then Pilate went to the people who were accusing Jesus and said, you know, I don't, I don't find any accusation against him. So we don't know what Jesus' response looks like, which would help us a lot in understanding how Pilate asks this question. Does Jesus respond with sarcasm? Does he respond with anger? Does he uh, respond with an enigmatic saying? Does he respond with a uh, parable? Does he respond with silence? Or is it possible that Pilate asks this question, what is truth, and then just turns around and runs away? Like he actually doesn't want to know. I, I wonder. So I'd like to do that old acting exercise with you again. Uh, here's three possible readings of Pilate's words, Pilate's question, what is truth? To help me out, Matthew David is going to gonna play the part of Jesus. And this is the first of the three. The first one goes like this. This is Pilate as haughty, um, haughty king. So you're a king. You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. 
What is truth? So this is uh, uh, Pilate as, uh, as someone who's used to people kissing his ring, who is used to all the doors being opened for him, who is uh, uh, a nihilist, who is interested in his own power and his own pleasure and is not interested in anything that gets in the way of that and figures that's how the world works. People are interested in their own power and their own pleasure. And anyone who thinks differently is kind of foolish. Uh, this may be a, a tempting reading of Pilate, and it may be one that we are familiar with from, uh, from movies or, or whatever that tell the story of the end of Jesus' life. It's Pilate as kind of capital E evil, as a villain. And there's something really appealing about that, right? Um, villains are fun. Uh, if you have ever been to a children's pantomime, if you've ever been to see wrestling, I probably shouldn't admit I've been to wrestling, but I've been to wrestling, um, you will know that the villain is the one who makes the entire show work. Uh, the, the show gets to a next level when that character steps onto the stage and everybody boos. Uh, that's, there's, something, there's something really cool at stake in that moment, and we're setting the stage for the, the, the hero to put things right. Here's the trick, uh, though. Villains are almost always caricatures. They are almost always not real people. And my, my sense, my conviction, is that generally speaking, Scripture tells us the story of real people. Uh, I, my, uh, moving through the world, I think very few folks uh, deliberately set out to do evil things. I think most people who do wicked things uh, most, when we do wicked things, we are generally doing so uh, and telling ourselves a story that what we're doing is good or necessary. So we have the, actually the expression, a necessary evil, right? This is a thing that, uh, yeah, it's, it's wrong, but it's, it's going to create a greater good. That's another expression, actually, a greater good. We have the expression, a white lie. So yes, I'm being dishonest, but that's, it's ultimately necessary for me to do so. And I think that most people, uh, when we do wicked things, when we do immoral things, are telling stories like that. So I'm not totally sold in Pilate as villain, as, as appealing as it might be. Here's another try. This is Pilate as, as bureaucrat, as someone whose wheels are stuck in the mud of administration. So uh, it says here, you're a king. You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Uh-huh. And what is truth? <laughs> so that's, this one feels a little more real to me. Uh, I think we have, many of us, met people who have uh, acted like this. Maybe we've been people who have acted like this. It is uh, Hannah Arendt uh, who uh, writes about the trial of Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem in the 60s. Uh, Eichmann being one of the chief perpetrators of the Holocaust, uh, a mass murderer who never killed anyone with his own hands. He was an administrator. Um, and Arendt famously or infamously, to great controversy anyway, subtitles her book, The Banality of Evil. Because she, she goes to uh, Jerusalem and you know maybe is expecting to meet a monster and Eichmann turns out to be this sort of goofy uh, accountant who, uh, it turns out, was able to participate in monstrous evil by using euphemism, uh, by, by thinking of it. Him and his colleagues sort of thought of what they were doing as though they were shipping widgets around, uh, as though there was actually no real harm taking place to real people. Uh, she says in her book that Eichmann on one occasion or two was actually directly confronted with the incredible violence, the incredible evil of the Holocaust. And he was really very shocked by it and didn't want to see that again uh, because there was, there was now a big dissonance between the story he was telling himself and what he was encountering in reality. 
And I think, I mean, most of us are not mass murderers. I hope most of us are not mass murderers. But again, I think there's something that we may recognize here, uh, a tactic for functioning in life that we may recognize. Uh, I will sometimes be um, sorting laundry and see a tag that says made in Bangladesh. And I've read stories about factories in Bangladesh, but I don't like to think about that. Or uh, sometimes I'll be looking at my retirement savings and, uh, and there's a list of companies in which, uh, in which we've invested our retirement savings. And like, gosh, what are these companies doing in the world? There's some names I've heard of and sometimes they're not doing great things, but I don't like to think about that. There's any number of examples we can give. Uh, are there ways I live my life? Are there ways that I set up my neighborhood? Are there ways that I travel that contribute to global warming, that contribute to the suffering of my neighbor? I don't like to think about that stuff. So I, I can sort of understand Pilate as someone who is facilitating, causing incredible evil but is, uh, is telling a story that he's, he's just kind of doing his job and you can't really blame him for doing that. I want to try one more. And um, uh, this one is, is, cause I think we're getting closer to something that feels true or real, but this one is slightly different. And this is uh, a pilot as someone who is genuinely surprised by Jesus. So the first part is the same. Pilate is still this bureaucrat with his wheel stuck in the mud, but then, um, then he gets surprised. So, uh, Mr. Christ, is it? One more question. Uh, you're a king. You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. What is truth? So my hunch is this one might be right. Or maybe I should say this differently. This is the one that I want to be right. I am really drawn to the idea that Pilate is startled by Jesus, that he is, he's carrying out his duties this kind of everyday cruelty. Who knows how many people he interviews in a day before deciding whether they're going to go free or go to the cross. And it's become this, this perverse routine. And something about Jesus, Jesus' words, uh, Jesus' actions, just being in the presence of the Son of God uh, uh, pulls him out. Of, of his routine, and he is startled. And this question is authentic and searching and full of longing. It's actually spoken from his heart. And uh, maybe he's startled by that, and maybe the guards who are in the room with Jesus and Pilate are startled by that. They're so used to the cruelty being uh, uh, just... Uh, cranked out like it was an assembly line, that suddenly to hear Pilate speaking with longing and, and speaking with a genuine searching, uh, they, they too perk up and look over at him. And maybe Pilate notices them noticing and becomes afraid. This is, uh, this is a pivot moment. This is the pivot moment in Pilate's life. He's got this opportunity, this invitation into transformation, this invitation into salvation, this invitation to uh, live differently. And he almost takes it, but then he kind of cops out, doesn't he? Because uh, what he does next is to say, well, maybe, maybe I can have Jesus and also have that promotion I was hoping for. Maybe I can have Jesus and also... Um, uh, go back to Rome and have this amazing new job. And so he goes out and goes to the people who has, have, uh, have accused Jesus. And remember, Pilate the, has the absolute authority to just say, uh, you know what, he's innocent and he's going free. Uh, but he goes out and he says to the, uh, the folks who've accused Jesus, um, gosh, I think, I think he's innocent. We should probably let him go. 
but the people who've accused Jesus insist, and then Pilate does the most cowardly thing of his life. He washes his hands and says, I- I'm not doing this. You are the one who is doing this. And that too feels real, doesn't it? Uh, that too is something that, um, again, even if we haven't been on the scale of, I hope we have not been on the scale uh, of deciding whether someone is going to be executed or not, I think this is something that we know and w- that we do. Um, you know, it's not me. It wasn't me who, who did that, even if manifestly we are, uh, we're making a decision to cause harm. So which reading is correct? Is Pilate this, this haughty king? Is he this bumbling bureaucrat? Is he someone who is startled by Jesus almost, but not quite into new life? Or is there still another possibility? And what do these different readings have to teach us? Us who, even if we are not kings, and thanks be to God, are not in charge of executions, even if we, we make a lot of the same rationalizations as Pilate. I think, I think another thing we have in common with Pilate is that we maybe don't expect Jesus to show up in our lives Uh, We're surprised when Jesus shows up. There's a reason that scripture says over and over, stay awake, be ready. You don't know the hour when Jesus is coming. And there's a reason scripture says when Jesus comes, he's not going to be who you expect. Jesus is likely to be a poor person. Jesus is likely to be a stranger. Jesus is likely to be a foreigner. In Pilate's case, Jesus is likely to be a prisoner in handcuffs. So stay awake, be ready, be open to the coming of Jesus so that when Jesus comes and tells the truth, we will be ready to listen.